What's up, guys? This is David, a.k.a. Reverse Long with the Friendly Bear Podcast. Today, I have a special guest, Haim Bodek, uh, coming on the podcast. So I, I first found out about Haim Bodek way long time ago when I was getting started with trading with the awesome documentary, The Wall Street Code, where they break down HFT, high-frequency trading, and all that stuff. Um, Haim what is known for being the HFT whistleblower and uh, he runs his own or he's, he's has ran in the past. And I guess now too high frequency trading firms, he runs his own consulting and he has a crypto fund now. And he's written these, these couple of books on frequent high frequency trading. Uh, the problem of HFT and the market structure crisis, which are really fascinating. You guys get a hand, uh, at, get some of those books and check them out. Um, okay. Hi. So you want to give a background on yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll try to, we'll see how, if I can keep it short. Um, so I started out uh, I, I, in uh, 1996, before I got into uh, trading, I started out uh, at a, a company that did, uh, that used uh, machine learning uh, to do credit card fraud detection. And uh, we, you know, some of my first uh, algorithms ever that operated in the market were, you um, uh, well, actually, my first algorithms were uh, deployed at Visa and uh, did score credit card, uh, you know, transactions uh, for fraud. At that time, we were, it, um, I think it was about like uh, eh, fifty thousand an hour or something like that of high risk cards. So the but what was so important about that experience is um, founder of that company, uh, Robert Grossman. Is really one of the guy, the founding fathers of the big data, uh, just the whole field. And um, there was a a group of us, four of us, and we were kind of immersed in that um, environment. And that's where I basically got uh, my core competencies in terms of technology and analytics and large data. And you know, of course, that leads to high frequency trading. Um, so in uh, 1997. I um, got cocky. There was a lot of uh, uh, of hype about using things like neural networks in uh, in the, to forecast markets, and uh, I found a uh, an opportunity at Hull Trading, which is one of the legendary uh, firms of, of that era uh, in Chicago. And um, Hull Trading was an option market making firm. I was kind of pulled in. To work in the forecasting group, but um, uh, things got restructured just a mere like six months later, and uh, my career kind of changed. And um, what happened is I I didn't know it at the time, but I was, uh, you know, the way I saw it was uh, I had a particular, you know, skill set. I was in the financial engineering group, uh, and you know there were a lot of PhDs and people who were a lot better than me. And I was kind of, you know, quite low down the ranks, but I was the strongest uh, technologist in the financial engineering group. And what happened to my career there is um, European markets had just gone electronic. The um, U.S. markets had not, but uh, in, in, in options, but um, uh, firms like Hull Trading were, uh, were calculating theoretical values for the products they traded upstairs. They would beam them down to the floor. So we're kind of this very important uh, moment where, where the markets were moving from kind of floor-based open out, outcry to, to electronic markets. And um, I was the, you know, not the best quant, not the best developer, certainly not best, the best trader, but um, I was able to interface those three areas. And uh, that role became uh, later, it was years later, became known as, as a strategist. So it's like the fourth, uh, you know, uh, role within these types of firms. And um, yeah, I don't have to go, I don't think we need to go across the whole career path, but I think it's important if you want to look at what I do. Um, you know, my role has always been the intersection of those three areas and that those three areas, trading, financial engineering, and technology, all come together in the electronic trading system. You know, there's a system that runs and operates and somebody has to know how it all works. And uh, that's basically what I, you know, be, be
became. He became the master of the machine. I was really lucky. Um, after that, uh, I um, uh, went to UBS and I had the opportunity to build out um, the uh, global option market making business. Uh, I took over as co-head, I think in 2005, maybe. Um, and by the time I left there, uh, it was a little less than 10% of US options volume was going through the systems that I built. And I was kind of on top of the world. Oh, I bet. Okay, so, and what got you started to looking into the high frequency trading? And what, what is high, yeah. frequency, high frequency trading in your own words? Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's actually kind of, a, kind of great that I stopped in 2005 because I first learned about like true high frequency trading in the elevator uh -huh. <laughs> at UBS because um, it had started to proliferate in US equities that had not really entered into the options universe yet. And uh, a, a, a peer of mine was complaining that the high frequency traders were running these rebate arbitrage algorithms that would, you know, um, you know, that were basically designed to, to, to just make the rebate as the profit in the, if you're familiar with the make or take the model, which how exchanges operate. Uh, so people post liquidity and get the rebate. And uh, what these guys were doing, they were Chicago firms, other firms, is they were squeezing the, the uh, spreads down so that the, the, you know, the automated market makers that were coming from more of an analytical or like Statar background, they just couldn't um, compete with these super tight markets where the, uh, the algorithms were, were capturing rebate. But at the time, all of us knew that at the, at the, at the, op at the scale that those algorithms are operating, we knew they, could, they weren't making that much money. It was just, you know, so, so my, my colleague was, or, you know, my peer was saying, you know, they ruin the markets, they squeeze it down and they don't even make any money. Like, why would you do that? Uh -huh. <laughs> right. And you're talking about what, three, four years later, we're, to, we're, we're, we're seeing um, uh, at least one high frequency trading firm was 20% of the U.S. stock market. And um, uh, there were times when, um, Certain market makers and or sorry, certain high frequency trader trading firms uh, were, were having consecutive eight and nine million dollar days. So things changed dramatically from 2005 to 2007 and uh, and wow. after to in the early. Uh, you know, I, I think the you know the peak I think was probably 2000. Uh, I guess there's a big peak, but like. Yeah, you know, things started to wane after 2011. Wow. But that period from like 2006 to 2010 was very lucrative for the high frequency traders. Wow. And uh, so what prompted you to write the books? Um, well, that goes into the whole story of how I, I uh, inadvertently became SEC whistleblower. Um, the, um, so I probably should answer that, you know, the, tell that story first. Um, so what this, and then again, you know, I, I didn't have any real direct experience with uh, high frequency trading and cash equities. Uh, you know, your, your viewership may or may not know that the high frequency trading strategies in cash in the, in the stock market actually are very, very different from those that operate in the futures market and for those who are, and, and those operate in the options market. I was actually quite familiar by um, uh, 2000, eight or so with the uh, option market versions, but I didn't really know much about the, the stock market versions. And, um, you know, I, I uh, had my eyes opened uh, for better or for worse. Uh, it was in, uh, it all started for me in terms of the story in May, 2009. Um, I had a firm, I'd left UBS and I started my own firm trading machines. We were trading about half a percent of the US option market after I think we launched, we launched in like, is it nine months? I think we launched in nine months. Uh, we launched in all the exchanges, boom. And uh, we, you know, things look promising. We're up about, um, I guess we're, you know, coming on nine months or so. And um, it's May of 2009 and I go 
to my sister's wedding and I come back a week later and our business is kind of, um, you know, flatlined to go ne- to go negative. And, uh, you know, our strategy had, it, it had a 15 sharp. So seeing that kind of collapse in, in the P&L was, um, uh, you know, very concerning. And I, um, you know, needed to go find, uh, in, in our business, what we do is we, when we see something like that, we, the assumption is that somebody changed the code of the black box and whoever did it made a mistake and we <laughs> got to go find what they did and undo it. Uh-huh. Um, so I uh, went through iteration after iteration. I'm looking at every single change. I'm going back, going back way farther than May. Um, I'm trying to do fixes. Nothing's touching this thing. The whole business is just flatlining. All I know is that our options business is still making money. It's really our hedging in the stock market that's bleeding. So our costs in terms of hedging is just ripping away all of our option product, uh, profits. And um, I'm complaining. I'm going wild goose chase looking for this thing. I literally looked for this thing all the way up till December 2009. I must have rolled out 100 fixes that didn't fix anything. Wow. <laughs> wow. Right? And then in 2000, uh, December 2009, uh, and this is uh, the story is documented in the Wall Street Journal. It's, it's uh, uh, in, the, in the book, uh, Dark Pools tells the story. But uh, uh, one of the uh, representatives from the exchanges, I was at a, a party that they were throwing, this exchange was throwing, and uh, he says, you know, look, you know, you're, you're losing that money because of what we did. And he introduced me to uh, three secret features that they had introduced <laughs> at that time into the market and uh, explained to me how my orders were being abused. And um, I named them at the time. I, I was like, what do you call that? They didn't have names for the abuses. So uh, I, I remember calling them uh, Q-jumping, uh, cannon fodder, and fish food. These were the abuses that were like integrated yeah. into the machine. And um, three weeks later, uh, I fixed, I just fixed the problem because I started using the cheats the same way as anyone else. Um, so what's the book problem with HFT? Uh, you know, I, a year later, um, I met journalist uh, Scott Patterson from Wall Street Journal, uh, and he wanted to. He was writing a book on HFT, and uh, one of my friends thought it would be a pract- good practical joke to put me with him because I was just yelling about this thing. By the time I learn it all, the regulators will make it illegal. It's so crappy, you know. I just hated the stock market and the guys who did this. I just thought it was just so beneath quantitative trading. So I was just yelling about it all the time. And then I yelled about it to Scott Patterson. And, you know, in a very short amount of time after that, um, I'm an SEC whistleblower with the most extensive investigations of U.S. stock exchanges that they've ever done. You know, and I go through the entire whistleblower experience. And part of that, back to the problem HFT, is um, uh, the exchanges and and other financial uh, journals were actually... Um, muddying the waters in terms of what my allegations were. My allegations were incredibly specific. This exchange, this order type, these features, this date. And that was, and you know, that's how it started with Wall Street Journal. A couple months later, uh, there's articles like thousands of order types. Nobody knows how it all works, right? But I'm, you know, I had turned in certain people <laughs> and I didn't want my arguments uh, Kind of, um, uh, you know, inve- you know, um, I guess uh, devalued. And um, uh, uh, Larry Tab at um, you know Tab Group gave me the opportunity to write uh, articles to uh, push my position. Those were incredibly successful. It kind of blew everyone away because I just put it out there. I was like, you know what, guys, we're gonna fight like this. Boom. 
uh, and I put out a lot of detail, not all the detail, but enough detail to let most of the industry know that they were also the marks at the table. And that ended up being the book, The Problem of HFT. And, and, you know, that's actually turned out to be quite an important book because it became the basis for a very large class action lawsuit by the city of Providence against all the exchanges for rolling out all those order types. And that case is still going on to this day. Wow. Uh, it even went all the way up to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court didn't want to uh, hear it. So it went back down and it's in progress. So um, by the time this whole thing is over, uh, I'm kind of public number, you know, enemy number one in terms of the exchanges. They don't, they don't like me that much. Uh, uh, all the uh, similar abuses of all the exchanges were exposed. And um, there is uh, over 500 pages in the federal registrar where exchanges were forced to disclose features that had not been disclosed to the public before. Wow, incredible. Um, okay, so can you, can you talk about dark pools and how they work these days as opposed to the past and how they tie in with all that? Well, that's interesting. I, you know, this, uh, uh, in terms of talking about dark pools, uh, there's I mean, it's high frequency trading. I'm just, talking about that that operates within what we call something we call it the screen but the electronic marketplace uh nasdaq uh you know uh bats which is now SIBO, um you know nicey nicey arca and all that um the, the algos operate in those electronic exchanges but um that is only about 60 percent of the stock market actually trades on exchanges uh, the other 40% trades in what we call the dark. And the dark, um, so when you say the word dark pool, that's a specific meaning to me, but it kind of is used incorrectly at times. Sometimes dark pools are basically used to refer to the entire 40% of the volume that occurs off exchange. Other times it's uh, uh, used, and that's why I use it, to refer to, refer to a specific type of uh, of uh, matching engine environment or you know pseudo exchange you know it's, it's basically an exchange that you're that it's illegal to call it an exchange uh so they call it a dark pool um uh that is operated um off off exchange typically by investment banks so um i think the split is maybe 20 percent of the market goes to what are called wholesale market makers who trade like you may, may have seen all this press in Citadel. That's a big one. Uh, you know, they, they buy order flow and they trade uh, against that order flow without subjecting it to the exchange for competition. So that's about half of the dark volume. And the other half of the dark volume are, are these dark pools. Uh, so what's so controversial and important about them, it's, it's you know, it's kind of, a little bit overblown, but there's a little bit of a story there that's interesting. What basically happened was um, earlier on, and I guess the early 2000s, um, as high frequency trading was kind of starting, basically the banks decided to compete against the exchanges. And how do you do that? You build dark pools. And this caused a problem for the exchanges because if your main clients are like, hey, I'm gonna make these little mini exchanges that compete against you as opposed to sending order flow to you, you know, uh, you know you're not gonna, they're not the best uh, customers. So the exchanges started courting the high frequency traders uh, to get volume and the banks started competing against the exchanges by creating their own dark pools. So if you were a customer of, uh, let's say Credit Suisse, you, your, your, your order would, would, you know, go to one of two dark pools that Credit Suisse operated internally, right? And why did they, one, another reason they did that is exchanges were costly and dark pools were cheap for, for, exchange, for investment banks to operate. So you have all these dark pools, like 40 of them, they're all competing, but then they have a problem. They don't have any market makers. So who do they approach? The HFTs. <laughs> okay. And in the end, what happens is the same um, idiotic abuses that were operating in the exchanges just got introduced into the dark pools. Um, it's a mess. Wow. Now, how's it, you know, how's it today? Um, 
it's not that different actually. Uh, the uh, most of the things that I would describe as abuses um, were not removed from the market. The ex the SEC the way they addressed it, they couldn't have them like pull out everything they'd built over a decade. So the SEC just said, look, you have to say how it all works and disclose it thoroughly. So it's still all there. Still all there. Wow. Um, okay, so in the book, you mentioned that exchanges had emphasis, had emphasis on speed. How has that changed to other things besides speed these days? Um, okay, that's interesting. Also, question: um, Speed was was uh, a, a little bit of a smoke and mirrors type thing. Um, when these firms went from you know less than a percent of the market to multiple five, ten percent, you know, and how many? It's not many firms that can, you know, there's only so many percent you can have before <laughs> the whole market is covered. So um, these firms grew, and part of the way um, they deflected away from the um, actual um, tactics that they used to get advantages over other customers, like, uh, like the special order types I'm, I'm talking about. Um, they, they basically presented themselves to the market, you know, that um, it was speed, that that was their advantage, right? Now, that, this is a little bit of a two-faced thing because it's a truth and it's a lie. One thing to understand is if I get faster, if I don't trade at the same microsecond as you, then the speed doesn't do anything for me at all, right? Like, you know, I can't get like, uh, or let's say we're in milliseconds, right? Let's say I get a two millisecond advantage. I better have my engine fire at the same time in the same conditions as others, or else there is no competition. Speed doesn't help you unless people are triggered by the same event. And then um, I think Clot Lab, which is one of the HFPs, really presented it the best. They said speed is a tiebreaker among elite HFTs that know what to do. So wow. if you don't know what to do and you're not trading it exactly that uh, microsecond, you know, um, it's it's almost useless if you hear what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, it makes um, sense. But uh, it is the main tiebreaker between HFTs. Awesome. Uh, and okay, so the HFTs in 2005 to 2006, and I think you said the peak was like 2011. So what what was, what was, was the main the, difference? The end. The end. Okay. So what was the main yeah, differences yeah. throughout? Like, what was the main you know, um, advantages in some times. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be a little bit arrogant and say that um, a lot of the wane had to do with the SEC investigations that I was behind. Um, there was a very important, it's actually not been rep uh, reported like anywhere. I have it referred to in the book, I think. But um, there was a, a, a um, in, in mid-2012, there was a very, very important change in, in the uh, BATS exchange. And what they basically said is, uh, you know, they, they, had, they had the BATS, the whole BATS IPO crash, it was all disaster. And the SEC was like on their premises, like all digging into them. And they were the number one target of the order type investigations. And in the middle of all that, their founders step down and get replaced by a new CEO. And they roll out, uh, and BATS, the, sorry, the yeah, the founders of uh, one of the high-frequency trading firms that owned them stepped down, was replaced by a new CEO. And then uh, in the same time, uh, um, it might have been June 2012, or no, I think it was before that, probably like um, April, uh, they released a order type change to their matching engine, where it's a matching engine change. And basically what the, the filing says is, we're not going to tell you how it's operated for the last five years, right? Because we never told you. But now it's going to change, and now it's going to operate like all the other exchanges. <laughs> it's literally what <laughs> the filing says. And um, then that same firm whose uh, founders stepped down, who are uh, billionaires, um, 
they uh, their market share and their profitability collapsed after that event. And um, I do think there's, you know, this, call it, you know, my personal opinion, but I, I strongly believe that um, that it, that that one change to the bats matching engine um, was uh, largely responsible for the massive collapse in market share that firm had. Wow! So one small change uh, led to that collapse, uh, is what you're saying? Actually, that's one of the things that got me so fascinated. As I had, to, I had to dig in and defend myself against all this stuff. So I, I did review over a number of years and provide all my information to the SEC. Um, pretty much everything I could get my hands on with regard to how these matching engines worked and how the order types worked and how the interactions between order types, like all of it, right? Uh -huh. uh, and you know, it's kind of hinted at my book, but um, I was amazed at how precise the um, interactions were. Because many of the people who work in the exchange industry are not that technical, especially the business development people and all that. And the coders just yeah. code with the business development guys say to do. So I'm like, wait a second here. You got to be really, really, really good to make this order type. There's no way the guys I was talking over there made it. Uh -huh. And by the way, I was right. Okay. Turned out certain HFT firms were actually the designers. I see. Yeah. Of these features. Okay. They worked very sense. closely with the exchanges and told the exchanges exactly what to do to help their algorithm get supercharged. Wow. But as, as I was looking at it, it was that was the thing that was so amazing to me. And it, it would make sense. Every single feature would have to be so precise for things like millisecond, microsecond, you know, competition to occur. You see what I'm saying? And also sure. there was incredible similarity between the different exchanges. And so, you know, without going to names, uh, less than five people designed the whole thing. Incredible. Um, okay, so you mentioned that some, there were some regulations put to protect the public that actually helped the HFTs. Um, oh yeah, that's, well, some? That's, yeah they're, they're, they're actually pretty smart. So one of the things that, um, no, I, 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 there's so many topics here with regard to like, HFT to explain how unusual it is. But one, one of the ways I try to explain it is, um, you know, when I grew up in the industry, you had these, you know, legendary quant traders, Blair Hall at Blair Hall Trading, uh, Thomas Petterfee, Interactive Brokers. They were the ones who ran trading firms. Now, when you look at the HFT firms, you don't see quant traders running them. You see ex SEC lawyers. Yeah, like, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I won't uh, exclaim what I was going to explain there, but it's just like, it just makes, like, it's just an obvious tell of what's important to them and what they are good at and what they're not so good at. So when you have a, so, so, so why? Well, it's not just to defend their practices against investigations. Uh, basically, the story here is that in 2007, a body of legislation um, called Regulation NMS, which stands for the National Market System, was rolled out and it fundamentally changed how exchanges were connected and how the rules of where orders need to be routed uh, to, you know, to satisfy best execution all that. It was an entire framework that tried to take all these competing exchanges and, and, and impose over them a regulatory framework where it, which dictated when they could trade something and when they had to route it to their competitor. You know, NASDAQ could trade at one moment and another moment, they're like, nope, you got to route it to NYSE, right? Very, very specific rules. The problem is those rules basically governed interaction during that microsecond moment where HFTs wanted to compete and had the rules been implemented exactly as they are in the regulations, they would have prohibited the HFTs from actually trading during the microsecond event that they wanted to trade at, okay? So they, the HFTs, certain ones, I can't name them right now, but got really concerned. And um, that's the exchange was actually built in part to protect the HFTs 
the HFT owners against what they saw as the harmful impact of this body of regulation. So you have the CEO of, 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 of um, BATS saying that this is bad regulation, it's interfering with the markets, and that this exchange exists to assist HFTs in dealing with this problem of this bad regulation. And how did they deal with it? Um, they basically created, and this goes right back to what I keep talking about order types, they created complex algorithmic order types that very intelligently circumvented the purpose and intent of those rules. Wow. So what happened in the end is you had a two-tier system. You had uh, firms that could bypass all the rules and get away with it, and it was legal. But that wasn't enough, by the way. You know, those guys also rolled out hidden stuff because, you know, everybody knew that. You know, all the smart people knew that, and the firms that really wanted to, to prevail, they pushed it even farther by having secret stuff. But the, you know, the normal HFT industry, you know, the, the, the bulk, uh, they had these um, special order types that allowed them to circumvent two rules. Um, rule 610, which had the, what's called the ban on locked markets, which means you can't have an algorithm that puts a price to buy at the, at the at a, and uh, an offer unless it can execute. So you can't have the, price, the bid and offer equal, right? Well, turns out if you're fast, you always wanna be um, trading into a, a locked market because the locked market is actually a phantom. And I know that's kind of technical, but it's a phantom. You gotta put your order out there when you know that that price isn't real anymore because now you're at the best bid of what's going to be the national best bidder offer a microsecond later. Regulators didn't understand that, so they just basically said you're not allowed to do that. Um, so what happened? Regular order types, they would get sent into a condition where they created a locked market, literally get rejected, or their price would be changed and they'd be kicked to the back of the line. That was what your orders did. Okay, the HFTs, they had orders that were not rejected and would jump to the front of the line. Those were designed. Um, uh, you know, to thwart uh, regulation NMS. Wow. So I was going to ask you to, to talk about some HFT scalping strategies. Was Is that part of the scalping strategies? Yeah. I mean, actually, this is, um, you know, I, I learned a lot after I became a whistleblower and when I got um, access to other people. When I was at Trading Machines, one of the reasons I was able to so thoroughly understand what to do after that conversation with that exchange executive was, um, uh, was I was actually given a uh, specification of an HFT strategy called the zero plus strategy. And this is talked about in the book, Dark Bulls. And it was given to me, you're not really supposed to have other firms secret sauce, okay? But I was given this document. And I feel comfortable saying that I received it because that firm that ran it is defunct. So they can't come after me. Uh. <laughs> okay. But uh, that document um, described uh, how those rebate, remember the early on the conversation, I talked about the rebate guys. It was one of their algorithms. And I had never seen one before. And it was I was fascinated with the you know, I, I knew a lot about so many different parts of the industry, and I was fascinated how many new um, concepts were in this, this document that I had not seen anywhere else, and that how it prioritized things that were not a priority in the other algorithmic trading traditions. So the most important thing that it, it prioritized was the queue position. You needed to be at the top of the queue. Uh, I never thought about that as being an alpha or, or an advantage that you could quantify the value of, okay? But you can, that's like a fascinating, still a fascinating concept to me, is that um, basically the, the probability of doing a bad trade versus a good trade um, decreases dramatically as you go farther and farther back in the order, uh, in, the, in the queue of orders at the best bid. So if you're at the back of the line, 
you're only going to trade. Let's say you have a buy order. You're only going to trade, really, in practice, when the market sweeps through your price and you have an immediate loss. If you're at the front of the line, you're going to get some trades that go up. So HFTs understood this and they built it in there. Um, so what was really interesting to me about the abuses that I learned about from that exchange executive is when I looked at them in the context of the zero plus spec, it was like key and keyhole. It's like, I look at this algorithm, I'm like, how can you make this thing stupid good? You know, like just, you know, just, just, you know, absolutely print money. How could you make it print money? Yep, you could give it those three cheats and it would print money. <laughs> you know, it was like, yeah. but you couldn't see if, if somebody just told you about the cheats without you knowing how the algorithm worked, you would just be like, oh, that's kind of interesting. You, you wouldn't understand how unbelievably powerful it was. But guess what? It's only powerful, as I said earlier, in certain situations. And that spec basically articulated those um, and I'll, I'll just list off some of the concepts, right? It's, they seem so obvious now, but I just, I'm telling you, like some of the top firms, quantitative firms in the world just missed all of this, you know, and when I, and when I got this, I guess, when did I get it? To, I think it was 2007, I got the doc. Um, but, you know, one thing was uh, uh, you have your order in the queue and the concept they built in there was like, hey, I only want to trade with small orders. Why small orders don't move the market? I can scout back and forth. Big orders plow through the book, move the market, right? So one little trick in the spec was I estimate my Q position. And if I'm, let's say, um, this is a future spec. So let's say um, 20 contracts, you know, I'm in the 20th contract in the line. If I see 50 contracts print on the tape before I even hear what happened to my order, you know intellectually that your order is traded because your, your order is at the 20th spot. Now keep in mind, most wow. of the firms at this time are not even tracking the spot, so they can't even calculate this thing. So HFTs know from seeing that 50 traded, that their order is traded. And they also know, um, you think of it this way, if they put their order at the back of the line, super back of the line, uh, you, uh, you could do that with a hidden order. Then you would actually know if the entire, um, this is a different concept, but they're both related. You would know if the entire uh, uh, queue is swept out, right? If I just put, and you'd know potentially before the rest of the market. So there was all these tricks like that built in. So they would know that the price moved before the price movement was reported to them on the price feed. See, that's why I keep going back to the speed. You got to know how to do that first, and then you have to be fast. It's not just getting the market data faster. The market data you get, you know, they're basically forecasting the market data that you will get by using these kind of tricks. And uh, so what are they going to do? Well, here's your zero plus strategy. Basically, if it sweeps through me and I'm buying at, let's say, you know, a certain price, let's say it's you know, ten dollars or whatever. Um, they their approach to risk management was very simple. Get out. They would flip their trade and literally exit out as a you know kind of stop loss at the same price they traded at. So the way I think of it is like if it's not um, you know it's going to be, you know the thing of it is the orders are coming in and uh, trades are occurring on the bid and offer. Let's we'll say future market, equity market, whatever. Uh, those are balanced going back and forth. They're small. Anytime I detect a big order that could potentially clear out the book, I just liquidate my position at the price that I just traded at. Uh -huh. And that's why it's called zero plus because it was they, they were attempting to never lose money except exchange fees in price space. They expected to, you know, the, the ideal was to never have a losing trade, which is so strange. Wow. Yeah. To like build into your entire concept of, of a strategy. So these are some of the features that um, uh, I leaked out into the market. You know, um, the zero plus spec was actually quoted in the book of Dark Pools, which I thought was funny. I was, I was like, yeah, put the spec in there. <laughs> 
Wow. <laughs> um, what, what year was this that that was taking place? Um, well, this that document came from 2003 or something. Uh-huh. So you got to realize this whole tradition that I was not part of, even though it was so close to me, like I knew some of the firms and the people, I didn't really know what was going on inside. Uh, it started then, and and then, you know, it just took over the entire market by the by 2009, the whole market was taken over by this stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, and then after that, I just put it out there. Wow. Um. So, so how is it? Like all that you described, how has it morphed like and changed like these days? Is it more sophisticated? Is it just out of this world at this point? Well, the the, the trick is always um, basically what happens. You have equilibrium pretty quickly. If everybody's doing the same thing, right, then um, the margins go down. Now, there's an exception to that: speed. Um, I. Uh, had a uh, very interesting conversation with an exchange official who had been watching um, HFT's launch and shutdown strategies and launch and shutdown strategies uh, for a long time. He said that in his particular ecosystem, the top three firms of any strategy would make money always. And that people would launch and if they came in number four, even though they had the secret sauce, even though they knew what to do, they were not getting the right trades because of, because of their rank and speed. So you get two types of situations, either um, you know, having the information out there creates a situation where, where margins just go to zero and nobody can make money, or you get a winner take all where like three firms take everything and there's no way to get it from them without enormous investment, uh, right? In, in that type of environment, how does the industry evolve? Well, people have to find new tricks. And if you understand how many crazy features there are out there in the market, there are all sorts of tricks that people can discover. Uh, obviously there are quantitative um, relationships that get determined. Um, but you know, the, I've seen everything from um, uh, in multiple cases, I've seen situations where HFTs exploited a bug on the exchange that they accidentally discovered that they could take money from. You know, there's one that I, I found out about that uh, exploited reserve orders. You know, because and because they were getting charged the wrong fee, so basically an HFT could kind of trick the reserve order into giving it a rebate. You know, and uh, my friend actually, when he found out about it, got angry and called up the exchange and told them to shut it down. <laughs> Wow. So there's like stuff like that, just constant. You're like, well, what, you know, what, what, you know, how does it all evolve? It evolves with lots of a lot of small mini battles. And then now every now and then somebody, um, and these are the people I respect the most. Every now and then there's someone who invents an entire new class of strategy that is superior enough to blow out the other uh-huh. classes of algorithm. And when that happens, it's really, really interesting. It'll come in and just, you know, the others will just uh, literally die. And um, that's happened recently in the futures market, for the, in the HFT futures. Uh, the easiest, I don't want to say the names, the easiest way to track it is just if you find out there's a firm that like was the best and then yeah. two years later they weren't making money and it's like uh-huh. that, that there was a regime change in, in what algorithms worked. And how often does that happen? Um, the small little... Uh, the small little battles happen quite frequently. I, you know, I, I would guess in the order of like a few months, there's always some BS thing that somebody found, and you know, it's just, yeah. just lots of that. But the big ones uh, might be five years or longer before they get rolled out, wow. and they have you know specific people's names. If you know, if you're in the industry, you know like who did it, who invented the thing, and then you you get this really kind of ugly thing where the other firms want to get it. And you may have seen uh, cases where there was stolen code, intellectual mm-hmm. property disputes between HFTs. That's where all that stuff comes into play. Wow. So, okay. So you mentioned in the book, the problem of HFT, uh, the institutional investors leading to dark pools. Can you speak about this a little bit? I said the institutional investors. Uh, what, what about the relation with dark pools? The institutional investors leaving to the dark pools. Oh, they were leaving the dark pools. Yeah. Well, they um, 
in part, that was because the banks were executing for them and the banks were preferencing their own dark pools. So that's part of it. Secondly, they were kind of um, the marketing. You know, there's a lot of things in this industry where everyone thinks they're smart, but they like fall for like the group think. And the way dark pools were presented to everyone was like, you can basically hide your orders from the HFTs. Um, so Barclays told their customers that they weren't trading with HFTs and they could use the dark pools to kind of like not trade with HFTs while at the same time allowing the top HFTs to trade with them and hiding it from the institutional customers. Uh -huh. So they were fined an enormous amount of money. They even doctored their own marketing materials because if they actually showed the, the actual volumes of the, of the participants, it would be a huge bubble of HFT volume. So they actually... <laughs> screwed around there and it's all it's all out there and like, there's so many uh every year there's like 10 or 20 sec actions where you're like they were doing that what you know so this is a good example where the institutional you know institutions went to the dark pools and they were just fed to the same cast of characters you know and in the so i don't think it does much right it's 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 it actually if anything that statement in, in that little story I told you is indicative of how, um, you know, you would think an institutional investor is extremely competent and knowledgeable about how to execute in the U.S. stock market. The truth is they're completely oblivious about how the U.S. stock market works, and they're completely dependent on investment banks or people like me to make those decisions. And most people who really know how it works is mo much more interested in taking advantage of the orders than helping them. Gotcha. And uh, spamming cancel versus spoofing. Can you give us uh, some examples? Spam and cancel was one of the early um, types of exploit to get to the top of the queue. Remember I told you that things can we get rejected or not accepted or not personal, they violated regular mass, right? Uh -huh. So let's say I want to get to the top of the queue and I actually violate regular mass, even though uh, yeah, I try to circumvent it, but the truth is I'm actually violating it. So my order change is like, yeah, you know, you use the special order type, but you're still violating it for real. So I'm going to kick it back. They would resubmit at the same price. And we're talking about like 200, boom, 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 boom. It's like a polling algorithm. Wow. I'm trying to get my, you know, that's a spamming, that's why I call it spam and cancel. Uh, and um, you can't see this on the price feed because the order gets rejected before it hits the order book. So it won't, you know, it's invisible to the rest of the world. People don't realize, you know, back then that, that HFTs were literally sending like hundreds of orders rapidly within, you know, 100 milliseconds. Wow. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, until that little moment opened where they could get to the top of the queue. So you had to know that trick. Like you understand how absolutely impossible it is for like even like investment banks and mutual funds to like deal with this, never mind the retail trader. Like you're so outgunned when that's the way yeah. people get an edge. Uh, so that's spam and cancel. Now, spoofing is um, an, a whole different thing, but sometimes people get confused and mix them up. There's another version of spam and cancel, which does hit the order book. Send the order, order gets price slid back a tick. I notice that, I pull it, I, spam, I send it again, right? That's a type. That would look like um, spoofing, right? Now, what is spoofing? Spoofing is when you send orders to the market that are not intended to be executed. And that's, that's the definition. They are not intended to be executed. Um, and the spam and cancel looks like they're not trying to execute because they keep canceling, but they actually have a reason for canceling. The, the reason is they want to be at the top of the queue and they know if they cancel and resubmit, they could get to the top of the queue. So it's actually legal. It's a actually spoofer, legal. No, legal, 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 fine. legal, legal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The spoofer is the opposite. Spoofer is like, I want to make people think they're a bunch of buyers but I don't want to actually trade my order. So I flash it. Sometimes uh -huh. I flash big. Yeah. Sometimes I flash by moving the market up. There's all different variants of spoofing. Sometimes, uh, and that kind of dovetails with a, a variant called layering. And then, uh, 
<laughs> we make jokes about like, you know, uh, I do a lot of market manipulation cases that actually deal with this specific issue. You know, sometimes we joke about variants that are like in between layering and spoofing, loofing or whatever. So there's, there's all this like funny business and it's all designed to do two things. A, either trick a high frequency trading algorithm into putting an order in the market that would be beneficial to the spoofer. So a typical strategy, totally legal, no one should do this, listen to this. Typical strategy is improve the market with my bid, put a hundred shares out there, see if anybody joins it, okay? So now I get like a tick better because there's people now who are willing to buy a tick better than they were. I put my order out, they joined it. See, I, I, I created the situation illegally where the other people would come in and, and buy at a higher price, right? And I did that with a hundred shares and then I've got a thousand shares to sell and I just smack my order, but I don't smack my order. I actually pull my order as I'm smacking my order. So I just hit everyone else who joined me, right? That is actually, that's go to jail type situation. People, you know, could be sent to, have been sent to prison for that, that specific abuse. So that's, that's a typical spoofing um, thing. And, the, and the, the, the other thing about it is that you'll see in terms of like how the regulators uh, describe it, they say it's the intent to create a false appearance of supply and demand. So you hit those two, you know, you did not intend to execute the order and you created a, a, a false uh, appearance of, you know, uh, a supply and demand, then you're pretty much in a, you know, very, very light, you either civilian, but often a criminal market mani uh, manipulation case, you'd be in that situation. Wow, that's really crazy. Everything you just mentioned. Um, has so like has different forms of this been going on all throughout this time period that you, you know, from like early 2000s till now, just different forms, more sophisticated? Version. In terms of spoof spoofing, uh, the spoofing the, and also spam and cancel. Well, Just, the spam and cancel was like a, a little part of a region, and actually, the main order type that I um, turned in, for which I got a very large uh, SEC whistleblower award, uh, that was actually designed to beat a spam and cancel strategy. So, on that exchange, you had uh -huh. to use. I had not slide spam and cancel wouldn't get you what you needed because the, the exchange was like you know what we'll we'll make it easier on you we'll give you the top of the queue in these conditions so you don't have to spam and cancel so like that was kind of a short-lived couple year thing yeah. spam cancel except for one exchange um nasdaq where you can still do it um uh spoofing has been across the whole period now spoofing is very very interesting in terms of who the victims are Many of the cases that you'll see where people were fined or, or went to prison are um, cases where the victim was actually an algorithm, right? As I noted a little bit earlier. And those tend to be day traders. Maybe some of your viewers who are frustrated with algos in the market, uh -huh. and then they realize they can outwit an algo <laughs> and they think it's okay because they don't know the law. So, um, so what happens is um, the HFTs, and you just have to believe me on this, but some HFTs do their own surveillance to find people gaming their own algorithms, and then they turn in the day traders to the SEC, okay? Wow. They call up the exchange and they assist the exchange in identifying they're, they're doing, they're like, they're basically doing the surveillance function for the exchange, you know, with the intent of having the exchange and or the SEC get involved and stop that behavior, you know, by taking these guys out of the market. So that's one of the situations. And HFTs will typically say, we don't do this at all, which I used to kind of believe because I didn't know anybody who did it. But now I've been working in this, in this kind of whistleblower expert witness in space for like over a decade and they totally do these activities the the hfts they just do incredibly sophisticated versions of them uh -huh. which a a regulator a normal regulator 
would not be able to identify as market manipulation. It's just fascinating. Wow. So for example, they would do exactly what you would want to do in a spoofing case, but they would have their algorithm uh, get activated when certain quantitative signals occurred. So they could argue, oh, it's not spoofing. It's these quantitative signals that did it. But then you're looking at like millions of events. You're like, it's actually indistinguishable from, from, from what the day traders are doing. You just got like this fancy reason for, for why you did the action. So it's completely crazy. And by the way, the reason they do that is that you can't prove spoofing as market manipulation without intent. So if it looks like the intent of the algorithm was to do something else and it just accidentally looked like it was spoofing the market, then that might be defensible in court, you know? Because it's, it's totally intent. crazy. <laughs> wow, so the algorithm's intent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, then that's the other thing. What's the intent of an algorithm? Is it the yeah. person, you know? Yeah. What happens if you have it a bug? Is that, I guess there's no intent there. Um, so you have HFTs doing it and you got day traders doing it and it's a mess. Yeah, sounds like a mess. Um, so how are HFTs used in the equity and stock markets? And like, do you know, do you know any examples or any common examples? How are they using them? What do you, what do you yeah, mean? like to manipulate the stock price or like, let's say like an investment bank has like an algorithm and they have an ATM to dump and they manipulate the price to execute, to dump the ATM. Oh, yeah, there's banging the clothes and things like that. Um, yeah, it's kind of a loaded question. Uh, I will say I'm one of the few people that does a ton of work, and I see most of the things that, you know, most of the regulatory actions I'm aware of, and I'm also aware of what other people who care about market reform or, you know, call them white hats, so I know of, of um, three or four cases which have been reported to regulators where closing options and, and things like that were actually directly manipulated. And it's just, you know, a fact. Um, and part of that is, you know, when you look at those types of situations, you, you, um, you wonder how the regulators who aren't traders, who are not insiders in the business, how are they gonna look at that? How is the firm that's being accused of it going to defend it? You never know where it's going to, the more obscure the abuses and, and, you know, you never know where it's going to end up. That's one of the reasons I do uh, many of them because, you know, I, it is, I do actually, I am actually able to monetize one of the few people that monetizes um, catching these things. Um, and uh, there are lots of things that are unethical that really stump the regulators and, and often they don't. Um, they, they, they may just, one of the most common things to do is to just force the firm to stop it and do nothing. So if you're one of the, one of the things you'll, you'll see is if a firm resists and tries to do it, then the SEC will go after them. But a lot of things we turn in never get seen. Nobody even knows about them. They just get quietly shut down. I used to be a, um, kind of mad about that. And then, you know, it's just how it works. It's just how the world yeah. works. <laughs> just, so then I just said, fine. Okay, fine. I'll just turn in more and we'll see what sticks. Yeah. But anyway, so that does happen, but I just can't uh -huh. tell you ones are, are occurring like these days. Gotcha. Wow, man. That's, that's really insightful. Okay. So, and I want to get your thoughts on uh, exchanges competing for HFT order flow. Okay. Well, one thing I understand is that uh, HFTs, um, built exchanges and were owners. So uh, I think, the, I, I don't know if the limit is 20% or like 19.99 or something, but um, let's say it's roughly 20%. It's, it's either one of those two numbers, but um, uh, so BATS exchange was built with TradeBot, which is HFT and GetGo, which was HFT, each owning roughly a 20% piece of the exchange. So when HFTs own an exchange, um, that obviously will give the exchange uh, a, a, a little bit of an advantage in getting order flow from its owners, right? <laughs> Does that uh, make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So, so what would happen in that case? Well, 
Citadel and Knight decided to do the same thing with Direct Edge. Okay, now look at the situation. You got bats with, with GetGo and, and Tradebot having a significant market share there. And then you have Direct Edge with Citadel and Knight having a significant direct, significant market share there. And in a way, you just asked me, how does bats get order flow from Direct Edge? Well, I'm going to just tell you how you know how do exchanges compete? I'm just going to say it in like one word. Exchanges compete by helping their clients make more money. I, as an HFT, will go to the exchange where I'm more profitable. The problem is the exchange also has, as their customer, my counterparty. And for me to make more money, on average, statistically, my counterparty must make less money must bleed more, yeah. their costs must go up. So what you'll find out as you look really closely at this is that exchanges have learned that the sophisticated customer that knows um, how much they're making or how much, they're, how much cost they're incurring is the one to serve because the dummy is insensitive. <laughs> To any of them, yeah, they don't know they're bleeding, right? So they're <laughs> yeah, so yeah. so taking the guy who doesn't know he's bleeding, and you know, Wall Street likes to say that's like the dumb retail trader. The truth is, no, that's actually the mutual fund and the investment bank, okay, uh -huh. and the pension. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys are basically the food for <laughs> the owners of the exchanges, which are HFTs, and that is literally how it works. And and I'm not worried about a single thing I've said in this interview. I've uh, I've survived this for over a decade, you know. That's the truth. <laughs> wow, that's that's this is but, fascinating. But think about how crazy it is. You got like what <laughs> fourteen exchange? I don't know how many you have now. Like, uh, what else could they compete on except helping their customers make more money? It doesn't even make sense to. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Especially if I'm a high frequency trader, what what do I care? I just want to make money. Yeah. I'll go to the place where I make the most money. Are they doing something shady? Probably. <laughs> Is it at least <laughs> asymmetric or kind of yeah. unfair or whatever? Yeah, it's it's literally asymmetry is the product. Let make everybody think they know what's going on and make sure that the people who pay you and who you're dependent on know more than the people that they're trading against on your exchange. Wow, incredible, incredible. Um so a lot to think about. <laughs> so, okay. So to start to wrap this up, I wanted to get um, a question, okay, about DeFi. So with the DeFi space becoming a multi-trillion dollar space, how do you see the relationship between HFT and the crypto community growing, particularly with, ver you, with unique variables of gas fees, processing capacity, and others? Okay. Well, there's so many dimensions there, and that's such a loaded question. Uh, I think it's more... Um, you know, I do I do trade actively in the space, uh, and we have a fund that uh, acts as a um, kind of an opportunistic market maker. We're, we're pretty active, uh, turnover portfolio at least ten times a month, that type of thing. Um, so what what I've basically seen is the is this kind of space evolved crypto versus traditional marketplace. Well, one thing you'll note is that certain HFT firms are very very were very, very aggressive and got in, okay? So they are, of course, bringing similar practices into the space. But what's very interesting is that um, HFT doesn't really work the way at least HFT would want it to work in uh, our space. Remember I told you how important it is to have like microsecond precision. These exchanges are just, the technology is terrible. You're connecting to these horrible like REST APIs and things like that. The arms race does not exist in the in the way it used to. And access, you know, the exchanges are more interested in crypto and getting like, you know, thousands of college kids to like punt around with their algos than give it like three firms super access to like microsecond connectivity, right? That being said, they do have uh, situations where certain HFTs do get preferential advantages on these exchanges. Absolutely. Uh, so you'll see that thing. 
uh, you know, you have the um, distributed exchanges versus the, um, uh, you know, call it the, you know, the traditional crypto exchanges. That's playing out right now. And um, it's just very interesting because there's obviously arbitrage uh, opportunities and information flow between, uh, you know, DeFi space and, 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 you know, kind of traditional exchanges. And um, I think it's very hard to actually pick the, which horse is going to win because the, the, the money is being made between, in the wrinkles between all these, these kind of, uh, you know, forces in crypto. Um, the other thing I'll say is that the, like we talked earlier about spoofing and market manipulation, that stuff is out of, absolutely out of control in crypto space. People operate as if they're, those laws don't apply. But it's kind of strange to me, you know, you haven't had like major enforcement actions by the DOJ, but the DOJ did announce that they're having like over a hundred investigations right now. And the way things work, um, you know, if I manipulate the market for corn, I'm gonna to go to jail, okay? And crypto is considered a commodity in the same way that corn is, okay? Oh, so yeah. crypto, the people right now who are doing completely crazy stuff in crypto, um, they, they are, there is a likelihood, a significant number of them will end up in very, very difficult situations with, with uh, in, in you know, criminal prosecution type situations. And they don't know. They think because no one's there doing anything now, that they can get away with it. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, for me, this is totally an evolving situation, and I, I think what we're going to see in the end is a really interesting cross pollination between what we see as the crypto space now and traditional Wall Street and HFT and market making. It's all coming in. It's kind of halfway there, and we're seeing it all merge right now. And it's a pretty exciting time to be in the space. Wow, incredible. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how that all plays out. Well, I wanted to thank you, Haim, for taking the time for coming on the podcast. I'm sure a lot of listeners will, will love to hear this uh, a few times. So thank you so much for coming on and taking the time out and uh, for coming on the Friendly Bear podcast. All I'll right. see you Thanks later, so Haim. Absolutely. Thank you. You too.